Hey everyone, this is Brian Funk. I want to tell you about my music production club, which is a monthly subscription service that gets new music production tools in your box every month, as well as access to live classes online and discounts from all kinds of places all over the internet and my What Bob Ross Teaches Us About Music Production book. This month is video game month for the Music Production Club. So during October 2020, you're going to get my 16-bit Ableton Live Pack, which you're hearing music made with now, my Super 8-bit Ableton Live Pack, and my Coin Op Ableton Live Template that'll help you make really cool chip music. Just open it up and start creating music. It's all set to go. That's if you join the Music Production Club during the month of October 2020. Head over to brianfunk.com mpc. And today's guest is Rick Seibold. He is a music producer and does music for TV and film. He's got a really cool course called Six Figure Music, where he teaches you how to get into making music for television and film. He's offering a 50% discount with the code FUNK50. That's F-U-N-K-5-0. And you'll get 50% off. Go to sixfigmusic.com. It's the number six, F-I-G-M-U-S-I-C.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I have Rick Seibold. And Rick is a musician, producer. He's an artist out of Los Angeles, California. He works in television and film. He's in a band called 310. He has got, uh, he teaches songwriting. He's working on a songwriting book. He's got lots of credentials in the industry. He's got his music placed in all kinds of TV shows you would know. I'm looking at the the site right now and it's like, it looks like Netflix, basically, like everything <laughs> on there. It's American <laughs> Idol, Lucifer. We got totally. Grey's Anatomy. I mean, you're all over the place, which is really cool. And um, I'm very excited to get a chance to talk to you and just learn about what you do and find out what's up. How are you? Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I live in Los Angeles. My studio is here just south of Beverly Hills. And uh, I've been in LA for like 11 years and sort of got uh, into this, um, yeah, rhythm in this place where I'm, I've been doing, um, yeah, TV and film music. And I work with all kinds of different artists from, you know, people on, you know, major labels and then indie artists and, you know, do stuff in all kinds of different genres, rock, I do hip hop music, I do stuff in the CCM world as well. So yeah, just try to like be broad and, and work on a whole bunch of different stuff and working in TV and film oftentimes gives me the chance to do that, which is super fun. Yeah, the so. studio is awesome. It's beautiful. You've, and you've got some great Thank pictures you. on your website if anyone wants to check that out. Um, yeah, thanks. Some nice shots. And, um, yeah, it's fun. Like like we were talking earlier, I tried to kind of make... So I came through Nashville. Like I came to LA through Nashville. I was in Nashville for a couple of years. And um, yeah, the thing in Nashville is like everyone has a studio in their house in Nashville. And um, like in LA, like a lot of the studios are so sterile. You know, there's just really generic like sound, uh, you know, dampening stuff on the walls or whatever. And it's just like, it just feels very sterile and, and static. And I wanted a place that felt warm, that felt comfortable, where like where people could come in and just sit on the floor and, you know, pour their heart out and write the best songs of their life. And, you know, yeah, so that's yeah. kind of what we try to do here. It, it makes a big difference in my opinion. Um, it totally, I mean... I always say that songwriting or especially co-writing is about um, energy. So hmm. having a good energy um, in the co-writing space, in the co-writing room, like you've got to keep it positive. It's got to be upbeat. People have to feel comfortable. If they come in, they're like clammed up. Like I immediately want to make them, you know, feel comfortable, especially because this is like the lower, this is the basement level of uh, the house. And so, you know, if it's somebody like I've never met before and they're like, descending down to my basement. They don't really know what yeah. they're getting into if they haven't seen my <laughs> website or anything. So like, you know, the fact that it feels like very homey and um, mm. very creative with a ton of instruments and stuff on the walls is, you know, my, uh, I think, attempt to make people feel as comfortable as possible. And, you know, hopefully mm -hmm. we can all let our guards down and write something great, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean... It it's so important because it is like such a sensitive thing, like making music and opening up to someone, especially someone that you might not be that familiar with yet. Uh, I think it's an, an overlooked thing a lot of times in people's spaces, um, that like sense of comfort and just um, 
so like I, the first space I ever had to do music was my parents' basement. And it was not even yeah. really like a finished basement. <laughs> it was kind of like, part of it was still dug out in the dirt, you know? But um, I, I really yeah. appreciated when I did subtle things in that room just to make it a little more comfortable. And every little thing helped quite a yeah. lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm like creative in so many different uh, areas of my life, not just in music. Like I've always like loved, I mean, I know I do music for TV and film, but I've always like been, you know, like engrossed by television and film and stuff like that. And I've kind of dabbled in that over the years, but like also decorating is something that I really love. Like I have, this is so random and I wasn't planning on bringing it up, but like I have a, um, an Insta Instagram called decorate like a man, because I just love like it was like a thing when I was single. I'm married now to my awesome wife, Rachel. Um, but, you know, when I was single, it was like I, I wanted to um, – it was like really difficult to find masculine, you know, th um, uh, like aesthetic and stuff to like – you know, mo most people think of people's uh, – a bachelor pad as like kind of gross and nasty and yeah. like college or whatever. And I was like I kind of like want to do something really creative with the space of people because I love entertaining people. I mean I think the whole – uh, thing at the core of all of this is I'm an extrovert, you know, and I'm a guy. So I'm like, well, let me like decorate the house that feels like comfortable and stuff so that, you know, p girls can come over, but it's not feminine. You know what I mean? It's like this, this balance or whatever. And so, um, yeah, I've like decorated the whole house and I try to like, I took, I take a lot of pride in decorating, you know, my space well and a place that like men and women feel comfortable in, you know, but that is also like distinctly who I am. Yeah. You know, and as a reflection of my personality and stuff too. So <laughs> I don't right. know. That's kind of a long way to But that you know, stereotype, so. the bachelor pad yeah. is it's not a pleasant one. You know? No, not at Pizza all. Like boxes nobody, on the floor. No, and, it, <laughs> I mean, imagine like, hey, come on over to my house and write and we go down to my basement and it's like pizza boxes on the floor and just like feels like a bachelor pad and there's like like no one, no serious artist likes to come over and like work in some guy's bedroom. You know, I mean, look, I've, I've been there. I was there for sure. Um, you know, I was like in the bedroom, started out in the bedroom and it was like, man, as soon as I can get out of this, like I was in a house with like a few other guys. And then I quickly graduated to like, we had this like little tiny breakfast nook. I mean, it was probably, it was so small. It was so tiny. And I like set my monitors up and that became kind of the next co-writing space. And then like I started to, you know, to kind of graduate into like you know, having my own studio outside of my home and stuff like that. But now, like, I just love being in the house and I love having, um, you know, the creative space in the house. It's a sec separate space. But yeah, like it couldn't, it couldn't be, you know, some nasty like bachelor pad type places. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. not going to go well. Totally. <laughs> well, it looks great, man. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, you, you said you work in a lot of different genres and that was something that kind of impressed me about checking out your music, um, not only your right. own personal music, but the stuff you're working on. It, yeah. I mean, wildly different. Like if you go to your YouTube, it's very singer-songwriter right when it pops up. And then the, the last track you had, um, which I thought was cool that you said, um, like put this on during your next workout, Carry the Throne, new song from Carry the Throne, yeah, totally. Bring in the Fire. Yeah. And, yep. and that's, you know, the complete opposite end. It's like... Um, it's hip hop, but it's yeah. like aggressive, like um, workout music is actually a really nice way to put it. It's going to yeah, get you hyped. Totally. Um, so I guess like I'm kind of wondering like how um, how do you find it switching between such extremes and, and all your work is all over the place with all different genres? Yeah. Well, I should preface all this by saying that like, so I started out um, as an independent artist. I mean, I was like touring and, and traveling and trying to, you know, do the artist thing as a singer songwriter. Like I was in love with Jack Johnson, you know, huge fan. I grew up at the beach. I just like loved Jack Johnson. If I could have been Jack Johnson 10, <laughs> 15 years ago, like, you know, my life would have been complete then. Right. <laughs> um, but I was like, you know, I, I didn't have a label and I was um, trying to learn how to make records um, on my own. And uh, yeah, I just, I think I just like started co-writing so much and working on demos and production for different people that it, it sort of like broadened, I think, the genres that I worked in because I was like working in Nashville and and I would write country music. I wasn't super passionate about country music, but there's so many people there that work on different stuff. And so I was trying to find like different avenues to use my creativity in a, in a space that wasn't country or Christian music. Um, and so I think that was sort of like my first step into it, you know. And then when you're working in in songs for TV and film, there's just so many different 
opportunities and different genres that sort of work in that space. And so, yeah, I think, I don't know. I just have tried to like find where I can add value to, to different people and just be as creative as possible and work on a whole bunch of different stuff. You know, I don't do so much of the singer songwriter stuff anymore. I think the last record that I put out is probably, I mean, it's over 10 years probably at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, so to me, I feel like some of that stuff is like way in the past, but like occasionally I'll work with like singer songwriters, but I rarely do stuff as an artist anymore and kind of just operate as a producer and songwriter now. Mm. Um, nice. But yeah, just try to be like as prolific as I can and, and, and try to find opportunities where I can sort of insert myself in a way, you know, that can add some value to, to whoever I'm working with and like whatever projects come up, especially I guess in the TV and film space. Well, I would imagine in that arena, you know, they want a certain type of song, certain type of music, and they don't care that you have this background or that background. They, <laughs> they Just give me the music. It must be the way it is. Well, surprisingly, I don't think, I mean, yes, there's like two avenues of songs that get placed into TV and film. So you've got like music library stuff on one side. And I think music supervisors definitely don't care about the backstory when it comes to that stuff. Mm. Right. Um, I mean, you know, but most of the time that stuff, I mean, sometimes that stuff can have vocals, but most of the time it's instrumental stuff. It'd be like music library stuff is what you hear when you listen to the Kardashians um, or like when you're watching reality TV. For the most part, that stuff is like instrumental cues and library music or whatever. And then you've got the other side where like basically you've got people kind of who are at an indie artist level all the way up to the Katy Perry's and Lizzo's and whoever, you know, they get placed on TV and film, get their songs in sync. Um, and you know, those are like actual artist songs and, and, and it does matter that you have, you know, your artist side of things like really built out. Like people, they do care about, you know, if you're touring or if you are, you know, if you've got like a following, if you've got great socials and all that kind of stuff, because music supervisors are just like A and R they're, they're A and R's that, that are working at TV networks, you know, mm. they want to break artists. They want to, I, I mean, I've heard them say it, you know, all the time. Like, oh, yeah, I was the first person to place so-and-so in my show. You know what I mean? Right. And, and they wear it like a badge of honor, just like an A&R would, you know, someone at a record label who's, like, finding talent and stuff like that. Like, like music supervisors are the same thing. And, um, yeah, you know, they have this ability to sort of, like, pluck people out and put them in front of millions of people. And that stuff affects their affects streaming numbers. It you know, drives traffic. It, it, it breaks artists. I mean, it has all the time, huge, mm. you know, artists have become, you know, big off of like their placements in shows like Grey's Anatomy and the OC and, and all that. So yeah, it's you, quite interesting. Yeah. That's like a whole other way people break in, you know, as, as big artists, like through, yeah, you know, the shows they get on and like, you know, I could imagine if I'm not putting myself in the position of the music supervisor to like, kind of be like, yeah, you know, I discovered those guys. and uh, Yeah, because, I mean, I think at the core, they got into the job because they really love music and they probably also really love film and they love being creative. Um, yeah, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful marriage of like, of those things, like finding something that is really cool artistically, but that also serves the vision of, you know, whoever the producers are or the network or the writers of the show or whatever. Um, it's kind of a cool, it's a really cool, you know, job. I mean, I, 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 I think it's so interesting, you know, um, it's really rad. I don't know. Hmm. How did you get into that, into that, that type of world? Um, was it like, um, deliberate? Did you kind of stumble into it? Did you meet people? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Well, I was, I was producing and writing here in LA and I think I was like looking for, a way to earn a living in the music industry. Like there's only a really, you know, maybe four or five different ways to make a living in the, in the industry, right? You got to like write a hit song. You, you have to get out and tour live, which is like really tough right now during COVID. So that's kind of gone. Um, you know, if you have like a good streaming presence, then that's another revenue stream. Uh, so you've got like streaming, you've got TV and film music, you got write a hit or get out and play live. You know, and I mean, there's, I know there's like other things like you could make beats and things like that, you know, to sort of earn a living um, or you could produce projects for people. Um, but I mean, 
you know, your producing career really doesn't kick off until like you write hits or you write with somebody very credible and you have somebody like really great on your resume. Otherwise, like you're kind of just trying to convince people as much as you can to like, you know, make records and, and TV and film music sort of became this thing that, uh, um, I don't know. I just sort of like, well, to, you know, to be honest, like I met, um, uh, a, a bunch of music supervisors and a couple of them started taking me under their wing and taking me out and meeting different music supervisors. And this one music supervisor was managing, um, somebody who became a really good friend of mine. And we wrote a couple songs and they ended up getting placed. Like those songs sort of changed both of our lives because they got placed everywhere. Like I, this one song that we did, um, uh, this artist rivers, it's, the song is called walk in the wild. And it's been placed in an ad every single year since we've written it. Um, wow. You know, it was in a Reebok campaign. It's been all over UFC. It's been on Fox NFL Sunday. And it's been in tons of international um, campaigns and stuff all across the world. There's just something to the song that really worked. But um, Rivers' manager at the time, you know, kind of helped us, uh, you know, gave us like a deep dive on how does the music industry, how does, how does the music supervision world kind of work? And like, how does, what does a music supervisor really think about, you know, as they're putting together songs into film, like how do those songs need to react? What do they need to sound like? What are the, what does the pacing need to be like? Mm. And that was sort of like my baptism into TV and film music was like sort of getting mentored by him and a couple of other people too, um, you know, who really kind of showed me like, Hey, this do this with your songs or, Hey, this is what you were trying to do, but let's look at the songs that actually worked in sync and in TV and film. And, you know, this is how those songs sound. This is what they, they, you know, go, it's just like, you know, if you're learning pop music or rock music or anything else, there's like very, yeah. you know, there's like a structure to those genres. Right. And, and TV and film is sort of the same way. So mm. sort of how I got in. Nice. So does that yeah. affect, um, how you approach songwriting these days then? Uh, it does. I mean, I, so we're in w I, the music business, right? So one half music, one half business. That's the way I think about it. So you've got to, in order to make a living in music, uh, you've got to like respect the business side of things and you have to respect, I think, you know, everything has a structure. Even if you're doing pop music, it has a, it has a formula, it has a structure that you have to adhere to, you know, mm. why do all the songs on the radio sound the same? Well, because there's a formula and there's like a way you know, that those songs sound. And that's not necessarily bad or good. I mean, I think those same techniques like repetition um, and, you know, really like patterns and where you put the title and all those kind of things, those things cross genres, right? So it could be pop music, it could be rock, it could be, you know, Sigur Rós and Bonnie Vare and Radiohead, right? Like, you know, I mean, it, it, the song Creep by Radiohead is an, an incredibly poppy song, mm. I think. It like has so much repetition in it. Um, but it's also incredibly emotional and authentic. And so it fits within that framework. You know, it's the music and the business. It's the art, artist side and the structure, you know, both happening at the same time. So, yeah, absolutely. Like, I pay attention to, um, you know, popular music structures and, you know, what would kind of work from a business standpoint. But try to be really artistic at the same time, you know. Mm. Like, I don't. I don't think that you have to sacrifice one for the other. I think the most amazing people are people who are incredibly artistic within those structures, you know, yeah. Sam Smith, Adele, and you know what I mean? Nobody would say that those, those artists aren't credible, but their songs certainly fit, um, you know, into structure. you know, they're not doing songs in seven, four that last for 15 minutes. Right. Right. You know, <laughs> so, yeah, th there are, are, I guess like some indulgences maybe you could take, but, um, yeah, I find the structure actually to be helpful um, because it gives you kind of like a playground or, or a box to be creative inside. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I mean, you know, like it, it, the, 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 the laws and the rules kind of give us this freedom to be able to, you know, be as expressive as we want within it, right? I, I describe it like this, like, um, you know, songwriting and music theory or whatever are just like a set of tools and songs are choices. You could choose to do whatever you want, but certain choices will lead to certain outcomes, right? So if, you know, you choose to make your song very repetitious and you choose to, um, I have this, I have a couple of things that I like, you know, I, my brain is very like formulaic and mathematical. It's very good math, you know, kind of throughout grade school and everything. And so I think in sort of like these patterns and the symmetry and stuff and, 
um, sort of what I'm writing about in my book is like how uh, the what, what do these patterns look like? What is the musical math of great hit songs? Like what does Max Martin know that the rest of us don't? You know, so I've spent countless, countless hours like breaking down these songs, breaking down the Katy Perry's and the Kesha's and the, um, you know, uh, w- just popular music, whether it's like Billie Eilish, you know, the same techniques that Billie Eilish is using, um, you know, show up in, you know, Katy Perry songs and then, uh, you know, songs that are 30 years old, hit me with your best shot, Pat Benatar, like the melodies still follow the same, you know, same formulas, uh, all the way to like hits and classics that we love, Feliz Navidad, like they all, um, th- th- those four songs in particular have a, th- what I call a three than one sort of, uh, format to their melodies where like a melody will repeat three times and then it'll change on the fourth time around. Um, and so, you, I don't know, you just see like these things over and over and over, but nobody would say like that, you know, uh, Jose Feliciano who wrote Feliz Navidad or Billie Eilish right now is like not artistic. I mean, yeah, they're pop mm. artists, but also I think they're just like making music and their instincts, you know, are so, they so perfectly fit those pop formulas that it just sort of works. Yeah. Yeah. I think we absorb a lot of this stuff subconsciously, you know, 100%. Um, like catchy yeah. melodies are, are catchy for usually a reason of, of repetition and, and set 100%. up along the way. Yeah. Um, but it's not always easy to, um, articulate, I guess, you know, uh, like some of these things I've noticed, uh, myself, like, especially when I was like learning guitar as a kid, I was picking up on like music theory, even though yeah. I wasn't really studying it. Yeah. I was picking up on song structures, even though I wasn't really thinking about it as much as I do right. now. Yeah. But, um, that putting the label on it really does sort of help, I think. Um, yeah. Because you said songs are choices. And, and I, I think that's like a really nicely put quote, really brief and to the point. Um, because I think that's kind of like what you're, you're just making decisions. Like you're just deciding, yeah. okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And yeah. I know I'm at my worst when I'm questioning all the decisions along the way and I'm being too yeah. critical and, and I'm not making choices. I'm just like kind of floundering forever yeah. trying to figure yeah. out what to do. Yeah. I mean, a production partner of mine and I, we, we have this uh, saying like, make strong decisions. So whenever we're in the studio, we try to make really strong decisions and just kind of go with them, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. Songs are choices. Like, uh, well, you know, if you choose to make your song very repetitious, um, if you choose to have a lot of contrast section to section to section in your song, if you choose to, um, you know, well, then that will make your song more more catchy. It'll make it more palatable. It'll make it more accessible for more people. You know, if you decide to write a song that's just full of like very long notes and it's 10 minutes long, like this is my song. And that's like your verse, your pre-course sounds like that and your chorus, like people will get bored and check out. That's just how it is. Right. But if you, and you know what, if like the whole song, you're just like, like so much information, you don't give people a break and you just slam them with sound for seven minutes, people will get tired and they won't like want to put your song on repeat. So great songs have this balance between those you know, I say also, uh, songs are like seesaws. They have balance. Um, you know, so if you like load down, let's say your verse with a whole bunch of lyrics, you know, it's, it probably be prudent to let your verse or sorry, your chorus breathe a little bit more. Like mm. look at me now from Chris Brown is a great example of this where like Busta Rhymes is like, you know, and he's just going on and on and on. It's this like crazy long, like oh, just so many words that you can't even count them. And then when you get to the chorus of the song, the only words are look at me now. And then there's a whole bunch of space. Like look mm. at me now, space, 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 you know? So, um, you know, songs are like seesaws. Like they've got to be balanced. You can't just, um, and, and that's sort of the, some of the stuff that I talk about like in Six Figure Music and then the book that I'm writing that you've got to have balance. Like they've got, to, songs have to have balance. They have to have contrast. Um, they have to have a massive amount of repetition. But, you know, I don't I don't know if there's like even too much, you know, it, Whip Nene is like a great, uh, you remember that song like uh, by Silento, like way back in the, you know, it's probably like four years ago, five years, you know, watch me whip, now watch me Nene. Remember that song? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, that, that song is like a perfect example of like a perfect structural song, perfect stru- structural pop song, how it's like every single eight bars, like it's changing to something completely new 
completely new, completely new. It never gets old, even though there are like some eight bar sections in that song where like they'll, they say uh, the word bop, like bop, 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 whatever, like 20 something times, maybe almost 30 times, like in a section. It's just a massive amount of repetition. But because of the contrast of the sections, you never get tired of it because, mm. you know, eight bars is sort of this like perfect amount of time to like get something sort of stuck in your brain, but not too much time to where you get tired or bored of it. Right, right. Yeah, that's the trick with the hook <laughs> is uh, yeah. the uh, moderation, I guess, you know, like is it does need to be repeated and put in your face a little bit, but yeah, it's a fine line be between that and being catchy and then annoying and just totally. too much. You know, it becomes annoying if you do the same thing over like three and a half minutes. But if you have a 15 second section, you know, that's eight bars or 20 seconds or whatever, you know, your eight bar section would be, it, it's, you know, it, yeah, it, it's not as annoying as long as it's like, I mean, there, there are some other factors and stuff involved too, mm -hmm. but, but I think you could jam a ton of repetition into an eight bar section as long as the next section contrasts it well enough, mm -hmm. you know? Like if you give people, because people now we expect like, oh, I can feel the eight bars is coming up and the next section is going to turn over. And as soon as you move into the next section, if it's the same thing, people sort of like check out. But it's this this build up, build up, build up. And then finally there's a release that happens when there's a change that happens after eight bars. Mm. Yeah, tension and release. Tension and release, over totally. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, So uh, I, I, I tend to see like most pop songs are – built on blocks of eight bars. That's sort of where I start out and when I, you know, I'm talking about like the Billboard Hot 100 patterns. Like most songs on the Billboard Hot 100 are built on blocks of eight bars. So, you know, you've got, um, or, or, you know, sometimes a, a verse, or sorry, an intro might be four bars or something like that, or a pre-chorus could be four bars. But generally like verses are eight bars. Um, sometimes they're 16, but if they're 16, bars generally you'll, you'll have melody changes at that second eight bars you'll have production changes like different elements will come in different elements will drop out my point is like every eight bars there's a contrast that happens either an adding or a reduction of like you know instruments of uh changing of melodies changing of like note lengths changing of you know a whole bunch of different things dynamics like how loud and soft something is mm -hmm. so that's sort of how i approach pop music i don't know if that makes sense but no, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, yes. I mean, you said mathematical minded before, I think. So, yeah. I mean, I can see like that's something I love about music too is like it yeah. is very mathematical and f it can be yeah. scientific or formulaic, but it's also so emotional and creative. It's this weird seesaw balance of these kind of opposite ended, you know, you don't I don't really think of those two going together in many other things in life, but in music, yeah, there's something about that, yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, yeah, I see it in like, let's see, film is a great example, right? So you've got this like, you know, there's this thing where like everybody wants to be like comf you know comfortable at home or feel like safe and secure, but they want a little bit of danger in their life, right? Uh -huh. Like watch like children, like they'll they'll go out and get on a skateboard and like, you know, do the most daredevil things and skin their knees and then they'll come running back to, to mom, you know? Um, and there's this like, there's this sense of like wanting to be safe and at home, but then also wanting a little bit of danger or like, you know, in a film where you've got, um, you know, you've got very predictable things that happen, but you need those, um, those like plot twists, uh, that sort of throw, throw you off and keep you on your toes, you know? But the, if you've if you've ever read, there's a book called Save the Cat. I can't remember the author, but he basically breaks down scripts, and it's sort of like the the Bible for scripts. Um, and he he's like, on page twenty three, your script needs to do this. On page sixty seven, your script needs to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the whole thing is called Save the Cat because you've got to save. Like it, it comes from some movie. I can't remember exactly what it is, but the point is like the hero has to win in the end. Like when does the hero not win in the end of the movie? Like most of the time the hero went like every superhero movie like the bad guys don't win mm. like batman wins the avengers like you know there's all this kind of like there's plot twists and all this stuff happening but in the end the hero is going to win you know you got to save the cat like couple's that's going to get back together couple's <laughs> going to get back together like what's a rom-com if they don't fall in love yeah. at the end you know <laughs> what i mean like it doesn't make sense and so there are like very predictable kind of like there's this always this tension release and music is the same way like you got to have this um 
you've got to have this sense of like normalcy of like home within an eight bar structure. Um, uh, and, and, but you've got to like mix it up with contrast. So like section to section to section, you've got to like throw people, you know, back in their seat and, and, or I don't know what the metaphor would be, but just like, you've got to, you got to like surprise people, you know, you've got to mm-hmm. like make them like, Oh, I wasn't expecting that. You know, like Charlie Puth attention. That song is so great to me. I remember the first time I heard it and he's like building up, building up, building up through the pre-course and then he gets to the course and then all of it drops out except for just the vocal and a bass guitar. And there's such a contrast to it. And it's so different than what you would expect. And I think that's a big reason why that song is a hit. It's because it's sort of like an anti-chorus, but it so perfectly fits the formula still, mm. you know? Yeah, uh, I think that point was made really well in um, David Byrne's book, which I think is called How Music Works. Oh, wow. Um, the guy from The Talking Heads, David Byrne, anyway. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. I'll put all these things in the show notes that you're Great. mentioning too. Yeah. Uh, but he mentioned like, it has to be familiar enough, you know, it can't be that seven, four to five, four to, you know, like you're saying a billion notes that no one can recognize what's going on, but it also has to be surprising enough that it's not boring. Right. And again, there's that balance where you you do want to be surprised, but you don't want to be totally left out in the dark. It's like, what am I even listening to? Yeah. The author of Save the Cat says same but different. It's got to be the same but different. Mm. Um, I mean, Star Wars is just a Western set in space, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Like, uh, what was it? Pretty Rich Asians? Is that the movie? Is that what that's called? Uh, it's like basically. Yes. I, I know what you're talking about. I think My wife was movie. watching it on a plane once. Right. It was like a huge <laughs> movie last year and it like took the world by storm for a yeah. little bit. But it's basically. Um, it's basically like an Asian version of like a Drew Barrymore, Adam Sandler comedy. Like it's kind of mm. cheeky and like, it's a great film. Like I love it. Um, but, um, y- yeah, I mean, one of my co-writers wife is, is in the, in the film, like, uh, singing and part of it. And like, I love, I love the film, but it is the same thing as like all these other, it's just a rom-com. It's just like, it's so different because it's predominantly Asian. And I think that's what makes it kind of unique. And it sort of like, it's the same thing, but just different enough, you know, the structure and the formula it's, it's, it's nothing that we haven't seen before, you know? I mean, it's, you know, the couple win- get, gets to, together in the end, so. Yeah, you know, that's uh, fascinating stuff because, um, it, like, there's a lot of, uh, like, tropes going on in, in literature and TV. There's a great website. I think it's called TV Tropes. And it's got all of these different, like, scenarios that always come up in movies over and over again. And... If you just flip through it a little bit, you, you get all of these types of things that are pretty much every movie has some variation on it and lots of literature too. We have these archetypes of uh, certain characters, the hero's journey and like these these right. paths that people have to go through. And it's kind of remarkable to see how almost everything falls into some form of pattern like that. And I think music is the same way in, in that it, it often has those, um, especially certain genres. I mean, a lot of like EDM, like with take the build out of an EDM or the breakdown and like, like <laughs> you don't even have the genre anymore. No, you don't. <laughs> no, not at all. That's amazing. I would love to see that website. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, it's so true. You do see these patterns all over the place. And I think the, that's where, that's where when you spend enough time and you put in your, you know, 10,000 hours, like Ma- Malcolm Gladwell talks about, that's where you sort of, refine your instincts like you learn those things you know uh, what I try to have what I've tried to do with students and people that I've taught you know my sort of my songwriting method is sort of fast track all that stuff okay put some language to um, you know what the structure is of popular music what are those things that Max Martin knows instinctually or you know Maroon 5 like every Maroon 5 song ends up on the charts why like what are those things that are operating in that song that make it you know so palatable by a lot of people and then songs are choices. Like you can choose to use those techniques or not. I mean, you don't have to do what they do, but you know, if, if like all you have in your hand is a hammer, like it's going to be really hard to build a house, right? Uh, you, it's just, if you have the tools at your disposal, then you can do it what you want. But every single house has a, has a foundation, has walls and has a roof, mm. you know, how you color it on the inside and how you decorate it, how you paint it. That's your artistic expression. For me, like the business side, like I was talking about the music and then the business, you know, the artistic side and then the structure and everything. Like to me, the business side of it is like, if you want to build houses for a living, you got to have a foundation, walls and a roof. 
Mm. You know, and then as long as you know it, your artistic people will hire you. Then, like that's the baseline. Like you got to have that, and then like people will hire you based on how well you decorate and you know uh, how beautiful the home looks, or or maybe not. I mean, maybe you're just popping them out in mass consumption. You know, for mass consumption, and you know you you don't care that much about the artistic value. Um, that's totally cool too. I mean, that's your choice. Songs are choices. So mm. I don't think one's necessarily right or wrong. But I do think that certain choices will lead to certain outcomes. Right. You know, I think this might have been before we started recording, but um, we were kind of just talking about songs for a second and the elusive, mysterious art of songwriting. And uh, I, I have days where, like, I, like I just find songs. They like they just they're like in the air, and I'm just like, I'll take that, and then I got it. You know, it just comes out of nowhere. <laughs> and then there are other days where, yeah, I have no idea how I ever did anything <laughs> and, and everything I'm doing is terrible or, you know, like we go through that type of thing. I was wondering if you had any sort of um, techniques or um, tricks you use to kind of get started and um, come up with ideas. Maybe it's, it might even be something that's been helping me a lot, for instance, is just jotting down phrases I find interesting, whether it's something someone says or something I think of, or even on like a TV show, one of the characters says something in an interesting way. And I keep those on like a notes in my phone. And it's really nice to come back to that, you know, um, we're playing some music with some people and it's like, oh, okay, here's, here's an idea. Let's work off that. And so I was curious if you yeah. had any kind of, uh, cause I'm sure like when you're in your songwriting sessions, like you, you don't really have the luxury of saying, I just don't have it today. No, not at all. Never. <laughs> I would never say that. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, in co-writing, it's super important. I think come in prepared if you can. Many times, like, I sort of, I just trust the process now um, and and know that, like, okay, yeah, something something eventually will come. I mean, sometimes it takes a little bit of time. Um, yeah, a couple of things, you know, m making sure that you're writing with, like, great people who sort of round out your strengths, I think, is super important. Like, you know, I try to work with really great vocalists. I try to work with um, people who are amazing at melodies. And I think I'm decent at melodies, but I mean, there are people that are like incredible and who have incredible vocals. So I always try, I always try to write with someone who has an incredible vocal because I know that at least we can get a great demo of the song and then that's good enough, you know? Um, yeah, as far as like tips and tricks, man, I mean, so I, I just... Man, I yeah, like I guess turning on your songwriter brain all the time, like finding stuff in movies and all that kind of stuff is super important. I love just listening to music. So I find a ton of inspiration by listening to stuff, especially if it's someone, you know, new and or if I'm like working on developing an artist or, um, you know, if we're going pr for a particular vibe in the TV and film space, uh, I I'll spend some time just like absorbing the genre or I'll, I'll absorb like what, you know, whatever is like happening at that moment in order to sort of like, yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're a product of everything that we've heard. And I try to like pull on many different influences in order to try to make something kind of like my own. Um, so yeah, I listen to a lot of music. If I get stuck, I just listen, you know, mm. and see like what, what has worked. Um, you know, I mean, like, I'll be like, oh, well, I wonder how like, you know, this song like bills or, you know, how, yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, doing that as much as I can, you know, and then making it my own or seeking, you know, finding inspiration that way is super important. Um, I think that's probably the the main way I do it. Yeah. And then just work with like really great, you know, people like co-writing and then like pay attention to what's happening in the market. And then, you know, l listening to as much music as I can to sort of like draw inspiration. Mm. Uh, you know, for me, like when I'm watching TV, like uh, oftentimes I'll like see something and I'm and, and I'm like, oh, that, you know, that would work really great in this song or, you know, that concept or this sort of emotion is happening. I wonder how I can like expound on that, you know, or like, you know, I'll see a show and I'll get really inspired by the feeling that the song emoted or something. And I'll be like, oh, man, I would love to create something for a scene like that. So maybe I'll throw on a, you know, I've got a TV kind of right up here in front of my desk and I can you know, put that on mute and then just sort of like write along to it. Like maybe I'll put on Mission Impossible and write something that feels action-y or like, you know, pump up or work out or whatever. I don't know. Right. Yeah, I've done that a little bit in the past, yeah. putting things on mute and just yeah. just like a visual stimulation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
because I think uh, I, I get I, I get good at and in the moment when I'm almost thinking like the elements of my song are almost like characters in a show or something like um, they're almost like yeah people in a room you know the the instruments are, yeah and and in that way like you know um, you need something to be over here maybe in the bass frequency or you need something over here in the background right. so that the thing yeah. in the foreground can stand out. But it, I I, yeah. I I like this idea of like the sounds are are sort of like these personalities, and uh, when I can it's really rad. when I can get in there, it's good. And and a lot of times it, uh, something visual will help me imagine. Yeah, you know, like this yeah. like naughty guitar part coming in. You know, kind of mischievous playing right. a couple notes out of yeah. the key or something. Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, it's uh, it's know. a helpful thing. So that's cool that you do that. That's awesome. Yeah, I, you know, I try to, like, so here's where my mathematical brain sometimes kicks into. This is what I naturally go to. Like, if songs are built on eight-bar blocks, oftentimes melodies only show up in, like, little two-bar blocks. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see if I can, I'll pull up a piano. Okay, so I like to think about, um, this goes back to my mathematical brain, like, thinking in songs, uh, thinking about songs in terms of, like, blocks of eight bars. Um, and melodies oftentimes will repeat in like little two bar patterns or whatever. And so what you'll see is like all these different patterns that'll sort of pop up. Like I was talking about before, like a three than one sort of thing. So like, if I ever get stuck, I try to boil it down to its simplest thing. Um, like a, a, a two bar block might be just something like. And I'll just repeat the same thing over different chords, like, um, yeah, so. uh, Right? So it's just, it becomes really simple at that point. Cause like, so I'm just gonna play like a four chord progression, right? Um, So. Na 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 Yeah, and if I want, I can apply different patterns to that. I could do the same thing three times and then change it on the last one. I could do an A B A B type thing, or I could um yeah, I don't know, do an A A B B kind of thing. It, it just, it, for me, that sort of frees me up to like not make things overly complica- complicated because I think sometimes we'll like mm. try to dive into a chorus and be like, all right, we need to write a hit chorus. Well, w- what is that? Well, when you break it down, really, it's just like little two bar melodies that you just need to apply some kind of pattern of repetition to. And it, and it makes things, I don't know, it's like easier that way for me. Mm. Yeah. It kind of takes the pressure off a little bit. I don't know if that's helpful at all, but. Oh, completely. I know that's a nice melody too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and it but um it's nice in when you're thinking of it that way too, it's nice just to hear how the melody changes when the chords under it. You know, the totally. melody is the same, but like it feels yeah. different like when yeah. you hit that minor chord. Um, yeah. It has Well, just I was kind of different... like basing it all on the the nine, you know, which is which is which is easily translatable uh, you know, across really the, you know, a, a lot of the chords in that in the key. So Uh-huh. Like, you know, if you pay attention to, let's say, like Taylor Swift or The Weeknd or anything, I mean, you know, there's, um, I mean, they they often, uh, uh, like, I mean, da, and if this is your key center, da, like, it's very, like, every weekend song, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's center of the melody is like on that nine, hmm. you know. Well, that can drop like, are back we out of the woods, yet are we the... out of the woods, and I'm in the beer, yet are we in the clear, like that Taylor Swift uh-huh. song, you know, so. Well, it it has like the nice pull back to the root, but it also, yeah. there's a lot of room to go forward too. Totally, yeah, it's yeah. this very like beautiful, like, you know, the the one sort of brings you back home, but then the uh, the two kind of gives you that tension that you need. You need mm-hmm. It's like, it's just a battle of tension and release, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think that that is a, a nice way to think of it. And um, kind of like these little pieces, almost, almost like Lego blocks or something you can fit together. But yeah. um, like the three to one type of thing. Yeah. Or well, some I mean, alternating. That, yeah, that, I mean, that's, 
those techniques like are meant to inform your instincts, right? Uh, at some point, you throw all that stuff out and it becomes so natural that that's what naturally flows out of you, right? But, you know, you want to have like great instincts. And so, you know, paying attention to that stuff, especially early on, and if you don't understand the structures and all that kind of stuff, then you really need to refine your instincts into something that um, I think will will appeal to a broad amount of people, you know? Like, I mean, I could, that, for instance, that melody right there, you could, that could be in any genre. Like, it could be a Bonnie Vare song. It could be, like, a Taylor Swift pop song. It could be, you know, it could be a rock song. It, it doesn't matter. Like, it's just, you know, there, it's just a structure. It's just, it's just a melody. Like, mm -hmm. how you paint the walls, it's, you know, to go back to the metaphor before, it's just like, it's up to you. Right. But you do have to have, like, that foundation of, um, of instinct and technique. And, and when you absorb enough music, those things become a part of you. I, I have, because I taught at a um, college for a while, I had to sort of be able to like articulate this stuff to people. Yeah. Like people who have never like done music in the past, like how do we get them to a place to where you can actually write a great pop song or write a great, you know, if, pop song, popular song. Like if you want to, you know, something that uh, appeals to a broad amount of people, whether you do pop music or not, I mean, yeah, that's that's totally up to you. But you know, understanding those techniques, I think, are important and can get you to a place to where, like, people will want to listen to your song again and again and again. Because when you do things like repetition, when you do things, you know, yeah, like, I mean, that's that's the basis of it. Like, if you do great, a lot of repetition in your songs and you have these patterns in it, people tend to remember them and they want to, you know, they want to listen to it again. Like, repetition is such a basic, like, psychological thing. Like, it's how you study for tests by doing flashcards, <laughs> right? You know, by repeating things. Uh, if you want to, like, teach a child, you know, what, you know, what's a cow say? Moo. What's a, what's a tiger say? Rawr. You know, what's a dog say? Woof, right? Like, y you reinforce these things over and over and over to children. It's how they, you know, remember things. We're not different as adults, you mm. know? It's just repetition. If you want to get a song stuck in somebody's brain, it's got to have a ton of repetition. Right. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I yeah. like it. it. It's something worth remembering. I I always had this joke with uh, some guys we used to play music with that, um, yeah. you know, if you make a mistake, just make the mistake again, and it sounds like you meant to do it. <laughs> it becomes like the thing you do. <laughs> it's totally true. <laughs> and it, it's a, it's exactly pretty amazing it. how often it works. If you play a bad note and then you play it again. The next time around, it's like, oh, that was the note. <laughs> yeah, you look way smarter than you were. You know? <laughs> do you do a lot of lyric writing as well? Yeah, I do a ton. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I love writing lyrics. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, lyric writing also is like something kind of simple. I mean, I think there's only, especially when it comes to, so I've been writing in TV and film for quite a while now. And I think there's something so universal about the genre because well, it's not really a genre, but like writing in that space, because you have to write about sort of the core human emotions that we all experience that might end up on TV. Mm -hmm. So if it's a sad song, you're just writing a sad song or sorry, if it's a sad scene, you're writing a sad song. If, if it's like a pump up thing, it's got to feel sound pumped up. The lyrics have to be pumped up. And to me, there's this like timelessness to capturing human emotion and like just writing about that are really like core things. Like a friend of mine, one of my old college roommates is um, a Grammy nominated songwriter. And he said that great songs are written about uh, three things, love, God, and politics. <laughs> and I have one more that I add to that is song, like some songs are just like fun, you know? So you've got like fun songs, you've got songs that are uh, about God, like Christian music, uh, new age music, and like, you know, stuff like, uh, still haven't found what I'm looking for, U2 and whatever. And then you've got like, you know, politics songs, um, which, you know, entire, like, you know, that's where rock and roll was birthed out of politics. Hip hop was birthed out of politics, like folk, you know, in Greenwich Village in, in New York City, like, you know, with Bob Dylan and James Taylor and all that, all that was like politics too. And then the rest of the songs for the most part are relationship songs. Um, and so why do those things work? I mean, and of course there are, other, I'm talking in broad, broad right. generalities right now, but mm. for the most part, you know, 90, I think percent of the songs are going to be about those four things. Why do those appeal to a ton of people? Because they're like core to who we are. Every human being has experienced relationships. Every human being 
you know, has some sort of touch with politics, everybody sort of thinks like, why am I here? Like, what's my purpose or whatever? You know what I mean? Like people, we think about that kind of thing. And then, um, you know, everyone wants to just have fun sometimes too. So I, I think that like, when it comes to lyrics, I just try to write about maybe those four things and then apply as much imagery as I can and like show people what it is that I'm experiencing, like what I want to communicate, you know, mm. like show it, don't say it. Um, you know, and, and I use like my senses, taste, touch, sight, smell, hearing, like this is something fun that I like, like to do with people. Like what's heartache taste like, um, the heartache probably tastes like three day old pizza that is sitting on the counter. Um, because I haven't, you know, had the energy to get up and like cook something. What does it sound like? Uh, it probably sounds like, you know, reruns of friends over and over and over because I can't stand the sound of silence. What does it smell like? Uh, maybe it smells like, you know, the clothes that I've had on for three days because I can't bring myself off the couch to like take a shower. Like all those things paint the picture of right. heartache without even seeing need to saying like I'm sad. You know, well, that's like your verse right there. <laughs> it is hundred percent. And then at the chorus, you can just be like, you know, being lonely is sucks. <laughs> and, and, and that's all you need to do. Yeah. It's your whole song. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I try to like, approach I like the specificity you speak yeah. of there. Cause you, you know, you, you are talking about these core human emotions, but there's also the specificity. I think that's something. I don't listen to a lot of country music, but I always appreciate how specific they are. Like in yeah. the exact um, kind of truck they're driving, the kind of alcohol or, or the kind of shirt they're wearing or they're in Levi's, you know? Like there's something really nice about that, that even though it might not be you and like how you live, it's, it, you get it, you know, it communicates that. Totally. Yeah, I mean, even... I mean, uh, hip hop music, rap is another yeah. huge genre that is really lyrical based. Like, like if you go look at the lyrics of WAP, they are so colorful, right? On yes, purpose. They are. <laughs> that they are so colorful, right? And if that's your thing or not or whatever. But like rap is a is a, you know, I think the great rappers are the ones that use like all these colors. Like Gold Digger, you know, from Kanye West to me is like one of the most brilliant you know, songs, uh, and, and I'm by no means an expert on the genre or whatever, but I just love the song because of the color, man. He's like, he talks about like, you know, taking his kids to showbiz and, and stuff. like. And I remember like showbiz as a kid being like, oh yeah, it's like Chuck E. Cheese or whatever. It's like fake Chuck E. Cheese. You know, it's like a, just another version of Chuck E. Cheese, you know, where I grew up. And, uh, you know, it's just so colorful. There's so many, Im so much imagery. There's so much visual stuff happening. Like if songs are going to be unique, you have to write about something like, and that, that's just like a relationship song, right? It's just about this relationship with this, this, you know, gold digging girl that he's got or whatever hanging around. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a core, you know, it's, it's, it's his base, you know, it's one of those four things like love, God, politics, having fun. Like those are the four things, you know, write about like stuff that's universal to everyone and then make it as colorful through imagery and your senses as much as possible. Like have, invite people in to experience it through the lens through which you are as well. Think about like, Okay, what if you know? No matter what you're talking about, how do? What does this smell like? What does it taste like? What does it? What does it feel like to be here? What is it? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's that's great stuff. That's exactly the stuff I teach. I teach high school English and writing and. Um, oh, awesome! I, I'm always talking about sensory imagery, the five senses. Like that's that's what it is to be, and a human in this world. I mean. I take them through the exercise, like, all right, you know, human beings, what do we rely on the most? And most people would probably say sight. And then we go to like hearing. So I take them away from you one at a time. You, you can't see, all right, so now what do you do? You're listening. And then by the time I take away the last sense, which is usually taste, I, I have them imagine themselves walking around the world, tasting their way around the world. <laughs> but after that's, <laughs> that's gone, amazing. how do you even know you're in the world? How do you even know there's anything outside of you? And that's like how you bring it to life. The, you you wow. show it through the senses. 100%. I love J.K. Rowling. Uh, I love like, um, uh, sorry, the uh, the Harry Potter series or whatever. Like her, those books that she wrote um, are incredible. Like, man, uh, the, the sense words that she would use. I don't know. I, I've listened to the audio books quite a bit too. Um, and my wife and I would just put them on in the car sometimes and just listen because like the, the, 
the the imagery and stuff it's like you can just see the thing you can see the the movie happening whether you've seen the films or not like just reading those books there's so much great sense of words you know in that and i mean you know there are like all the great authors do it you know what i mean mm. um yeah like if you go to walt whitman or like wh whoever like it, you know there's just great amazing sense words and and that's what makes it unique i think and it's Harry Potter is a great example because she's literally creating a world that doesn't exist. So, so it true. has to be that colorful and sensual through all your five senses. Wow, so true. And and that's uh, a great thing to bring into the songwriting. I, I thought it was cool. Like you basically wrote the verse of that song, you know, with the <laughs> just going through the senses. You know, and yeah, you're, I you're mean, painting the picture of someone in there. Maybe in their like apartment, like down on their luck, haven't gotten out of bed or off the couch, and then um, yeah, I think like I mean, maybe yeah, the chorus I, is a nice place for the like thematic idea, mm -hmm. and then the totally the verse kind of um, paints the picture around it. Yeah. Oh yeah. To me, um, songs are like. Um, and so I heard somebody describe this. I don't. I don't remember who, but. The, like songs are sort of like hot air balloons too. Like when you're on the ground, there's all these details that you can see, right? You can see like, oh, the trees and leaves and the squirrel running around and you can like, you know, smell the dirt and then you can, you know, see your car right there and you can see the details on the car. But when you fly up in a hot air balloon all the way up, all you see is like, oh, there's Los Angeles. Oh, there's uh, San Francisco. I don't know. I don't know how high you are, but you know what I mean? Like the higher you get, the more it's just like, oh, you know, so, so the chorus is like the, the hot air balloon when you're way up. It's just like, here's the whole point of the song. It's just like LA, right? Maybe, maybe you're writing a song about Los Angeles. Here's LA. But then, you know, the verses are those details where you're gonna like lay out all that imagery and all those beautiful sense words, you know? I mean, the great songs do this, right? Like Sam Smith, Stay With Me, you know? Um, the chorus is just so simple. Everyone, you know what the song is about the first time you hear it. Stay with me. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, that's what the song's about. And then he uses like, you know, the verses for the details and to explain the story and all that kind of stuff. But the chorus is just stay with me. Right. right. So, you know, yeah, I think that, I think the good ones do that. I mean, even, even WAP is like the whole song, <laughs> you know what the song's about from the chorus. Like, cause she just says it over and over and over and over and that repetition and she's just saying what the whole point of the song is, you know? And then in the verses, there's all this color and all that kind of stuff. But, like, the chorus is just wop, right? Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. That's true. And and it's, that's... It's the that's, way I think about it. That's yeah. where the repetition and the catchiness comes in. And... Yeah. Hmm. I, w I wanted to ask you, maybe, totally. maybe I'm, like, yeah. dialing back a tiny bit. But yeah. um, go ahead. when man. you were yeah. talking about... um co-writing with people and you know keeping the decor nice that's one way you get people comfortable Are, do you have any other ways to kind of yeah. like help people be comfortable loosen up because like songwriting can be really personal and you know i don't i don't think there are many people out there that are always in their most comfortable skin when they're presenting these baby ideas that haven't quite oh, turned gosh, into yes. anything yet do you have any ways to like yeah. to get oh, people man. comfortable? It's yeah, totally. Oh man, it's a, yeah, it's a very vulnerable thing to uh, you know. Sometimes songwriting is like getting in a room with someone you never met and taking all your clothes off, and it's like, oh, here I am. Here's my, you know, here's my soul. I hope <laughs> yeah. you like it, kind of thing. You know what I mean? You're just bearing it to everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, look, energy is so. Co-writing is all about. It's not all about energy, but it's a big factor in it. I mean, I know you know hit songwriters that are just like literally hype men you know, or hype women, like they'll just, they just, it's about energy. Like if you can keep the energy positive, then people feel excited. Like if people will feel comfortable and people feel upbeat, they're more willing to, uh, you know, just take risks right. and to, and to really go for it. But if, if, if the energy is bad, if, if like people are kind of, if somebody's like closed off or like you let the energy get to a lull or people sort of like get on their phones or whatever, you're done. Like the song is, it's going to be really hard. It's harder to pull back from that. Mm -hmm. Um, so man, if I'm having like a big co-write, I'll get like a Red Bull, I'll get coffee, you know, I'm, I'm going to be like jacked and ready to go and like re pumped and excited and smiling and in a great attitude and just like super positive. I mean, my favorite people to write with, and I know that they approach 
songwriting the same way. They do the same stuff. Like they turn it on. It's something you got to turn on. It's it's work. It's like, you know, you can't just come in and just sort of be in your own bubble or whatever. You know, you co-writing is an is a is a chance to like try to pull the best creativity you can out of some other people in the room. Sometimes you're the one with all the creativity and it's your day and you're the one, you know, driving driving the ship. Some de- sometimes it's other people's day. And so your job is to support them and, you know, or sometimes it's all, th- all three or four or however many people you're writing with, you know. And so just keeping that energy up is so important. And so setting an atmosphere that makes that easy to do, like, you know, if it's hot, making sure the air conditioning's on, um, you know, ha- make sure, making sure like you're, 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 you know, you're not hungry or you're not thirsty or whatever. Like mm. to me, everything in this studio is so intuitive. Like it's super easy. Like there's chargers everywhere. There's, uh, it takes like literally, you know, two seconds to get up and recording in here normally. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm trying not to wait too much on anything. Like mics are usually always set up. Um, you know, the keyboard is ready to go. Like anything so that we could be creative. Like there's a ton of guitars on the wall. Grab a guitar and you start moving. You know what I mean? And then the the sound really doesn't stop until you finish the song. Like you keep the energy going. Like I'll put on, maybe I'll just like lay down a guitar or something like that and then loop it and keep that energy moving, you know? Mm. I think that's super important. I mean, yeah, there's other things like, you know, yeah, but I think those those are the more the more important things. Keeping that energy up. That's the best advice I could give to like a new writer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, that's when it works the best is when we're excited. We're having fun. We're we're in the moment and yeah. um there aren't little nagging things on the side, you know. Uh, like you said, even just the chargers, it's it's a thoughtful it's thing. Like, oh, my phone's dead. Like that, it's like oh no, the charger right there. Plug it in. Let's keep going. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't worry about it. Anything you want. Yeah, you don't. Know? Yeah, it's not like a thing that I got to like stop what I'm doing and break the creativity. Like you've got to be in a place where your creativity can just flow, and good vibes make that a whole lot easier than bad vibes. Which is why I don't like sterile studios around LA, and I tried to like you know we've got like rugs all around the house here, and and I don't know, just like old. It feels like home in here. There's old books and, you know, stuff. It just makes people feel like, oh, cool. This is a place that I can feel comfortable. And this guy, you know, has his stuff together. And, and yeah, so I think that's super important. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's uh same kind of um, advice I give, like, for performing live, too. It's like enthusiasm is contagious. And oh, so true. If the band is having fun, the, the performers are having fun, it's really hard to not enjoy it on some level and just feel that a little bit. And um, yeah, like uh, being artistic can be tough and it can be, it's a very vulnerable thing, but the best way through that is is some positive energy and just support. And you know, that's, uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, I mean, and stuff. it's not the easiest thing. I mean, sometimes you're like... Yeah, you know, but you turn it on, like you yeah, said. It's it, it's sometimes a you performance. You got to turn it on, totally. In itself. Yeah, totally. I find and, that you know, with teaching. I mean, there yeah. are, there are days where I'm worn out and tired, but it's like, show show starts now. Like, let's do this. And um, it's a dog and pony show sometimes. Totally. And, and I think like there's like something funny that happens is like if you fake it, you suddenly become it. You know. Yeah. Like try mm-hmm. to walk around the day with a smile on your face and be miserable. You just 100%. stop being miserable after a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's this thing that like when you start doing physical things, like Tony Robbins talks about this, uh, when you change your physical state, you change your mental state too because like it's the easiest way to break out of like depression and you know, and like having a bad day, like get moving. Like if you're feeling sad, get moving, get active. You know, I can tell like when I don't work out for a day, you know, or a few days in a row, let's say, and it's like caught up to me. Like I feel lethargic and I'm like, it's just like so much easier to just fall into a funk. Yeah. Get, get your body moving, get active. Like if I'm feeling a lull in the studio, stand up, start walking around. Sometimes I take a break. Like I'm like, Hey, let's walk outside for five minutes. Let the sun hit our face because that's what you need. Get get a little vitamin D come back. Sometimes you got to break things up. You know, if you're noticing that the energy is like, is down, like, all right, everybody, let's get up, go do something, and we'll come back, you know? Mm-hmm. Because you'll come back refreshed, energized, you know, making sure you have food. Your brain, you know, takes a lot of, it, it burns a lot of calories. Like, you've got to have, you got to be fed. You got to, like, you know, be, like, 
yeah, you just just take care of your body. Like do all the stuff that you know you probably know to, know to do. Um, but yeah, show up and make every single session count, and and you know really try to bring your A game every single time. Mm. Yeah, right on. Yeah, man. So you got a lot of good information and advice, obviously, uh, on this episode here. But um, I want to direct people too to like some of your work so they can go deeper. Um, you've got Six Figure Music, which is the course about getting into TV and film. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, um, sure. Tell how I mean, to find that. And- yeah, I mean, I I think that TV and film music is one of those things that I've really like poured myself into for years and years and years. And honestly, it was like, I mean, I was before I really started down the journey of like doing TV and film music. I had struggled to make a living. Like, and I talk to musicians all the time who don't understand how to make a full-time living in the music business. It's very difficult for a lot of people. They just can't like figure out like, what is it to, you know, that will finally like the straw that'll break the camel's back. Like, how do you finally do it? Like, what do you do? You got to get a deal. You got to get a hit song. Like I said before, there's only a few ways to make a living in the music industry. You got to get out lot and play live. You got to write a hit song. You know, you've got to like produce records, but even that, like even live and producing hit records don't really pop unless you have a really big song. Otherwise you're like playing to small clubs, you know, and you're always on the, it's not going to be the the lifestyle that it, it makes it difficult to raise a family, you know, on, on that kind of deal. And, and so really it's like, it comes down to streaming, to writing hit songs, and then to, uh, TV and film music for me, like I found that TV and film music is an incredible way to enter the middle class of the music industry, um, to get your songs in front of a lot of people. You can, you know, build your streaming numbers, develop fans. I mean, I'm, I've been so shocked at the fans that have come out for like the projects that I, um, am involved with that have gotten a ton of traction on TV and film. And a bunch of the artists that I've worked with have like really, you know, seen so much traction and really blown up just off of like, you know, TV and film or TikTok or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Like that, that matching that picture and, and, you know, sound together. So yeah, I teach like, I basically break down like what music supervisors have shown me over the years. Like those, those things that you're only going to get from actually being in, you know, music supervision, um, you know, knowing like hopping inside of a music supervisor's brain, um, you know, has been so helpful for me because, you know, they've shown me like, Hey, uh, don't do this with your song or, Hey, this is what the song, you know, songs that you're trying to go for. This is what they sound like. And this is what works. And so having that, that kind of breakdown has been so, you know, important for me. And so I basically, yeah, show people like, here's how I approach writing TV and film music here. Here's how I've made a really great living doing this. Um, I think it's easy enough that like, if I can do it, anybody can can do it. And so I try to break it down in a very systematic way. Like here's step by step by step, how I've gone about making a great living in the music industry. And I know if I've done it, you can do it too. I've taught tons and tons of students and a bunch of them have had had a lot of success, you know, through like teaching at the college and then my own courses and stuff. It's been like thousands of students now and people sign deals. People have like, you know, gotten their songs all over TV and film. So yeah, I'd encourage you to check it out. Sixfigmusic.com. Um, you know, and I, I post stuff on Instagram, stuff like that as well at rickseibold.com, S-E-I-B-O-L-D. Uh, and, you know, bo- both of those places are great, great ways to find out more info or rickseibold.com. Um, yeah, I'd encourage you to like check it out and, and you know, yeah, let me know what you think. Yeah. And you know what? I'll, I'll even do this now that I'm thinking about it. Um, for everybody on the podcast, uh, I'll give um, a half off code. Uh, nice. let's see. Well, we can put it in the, in the show notes, right? Yeah. We can do that. All right, cool. Mm-hmm. So I'll include a half off link too. So everybody can hop in, um, if they want. So it'll just be for this, this podcast. Oh, that's super generous. That. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. I mean, look at the, at the man, my, I'm so passionate about helping people and about, I mean, I understand what it was like to be a struggling creative, like being broke, being, not understanding how to make a living. And one of my, like, I think core missions in life is to help creatives make a living doing the things that they love and being able to express their creativity. I mean, you know, in the Renaissance era, it would be like, you know, the government or like, you know, some like uh, the church or something would sponsor artists and then they could just work for, they didn't have to worry about money. Like we don't, most people don't have the luxury to do that now. So we got to figure out like how to make a living while like also being creative, creative and artistic. And so I want to do what I can to help people make a living in music and, and using their creativity to earn a living. So, I mean, if I can help you in any way, 
please, please like, you know, feel free to reach out and, and, you know, hit me up and ask. I love it. Yeah. It's, it's a great yeah. attitude. And, uh, yeah, you're, you're probably contributing to better art and music as it is anyway. So I hope uh, so. everyone wins from that kind of gesture. Yeah. yeah. To me, like life is a glass half full, like people, um, you know, and, and, if like I help somebody out that that's going to in turn, like come back. I mean, you know, having a good reputation and, and helping people, you know, whether I'm getting something out of it or not, like eventually, I mean, it helps the world, but those things come around. I mean, karma, like it's a thing, like it comes around. I mean, to me, I think it is like, mm. you know, I, I think if you put positivity and good vibes out in the world and you, uh, help people like that, that stuff comes back to you, you know, tenfold, you know, from what you put in. So. Yeah, I completely agree. And how about the book? Um, do you have a title for it? Do you have any kind of idea when it might come out? Or what what um, stage are you in with that I'm, right now? I'm I'm the like I'm book. nearly I'm nearly done with it. Um, yeah, and I kind of I'm I sort of like touched on a bunch of this stuff. I, the way that I uh, kind of laid out, or you know, the stuff that we talked about today, I think it's much more systematic and laid out in the book. Like I really go like you know, like lay it out in a really succinct kind of. Uh, precise way. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure yet when it'll be out. I'm hoping uh, maybe later this year, early next year, something like that. I'm still working on a few different titles. Um, but it'll be about like how uh, how to write hit songs. Like what are those, what's that musical math that like is so elusive to so many people? Like what, mm -hmm. um, you know, how, what is the song structure of a hit song? And, you know, where does that show up in song after song after song? Like I break down, you know, over a hundred songs just on uh, what techniques make those things hit songs. So, you know, if you're interested in learning more, yeah, check me out on Instagram or, you know, feel free to shoot me an email to rick at Um, You can shoot me an email there and, and uh, or, you know, feel free to hit me up on my website, whatever. So happy nice. to help and, and be in touch with anybody. Yeah, I'll, I'll be keeping an eye out for that too. I'm, I'm excited cool. to read that and uh, I'll let people awesome. know as well once that comes out. It's, uh, awesome. I love that kind of stuff, you know, just like, you know, just getting inside your head a little bit and how you do it. It, it just helps me figure it out more myself, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. Same, same. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Rick. And, um, it's been a pleasure talking to you and, uh, I want to say thank you to everyone else too for listening. Take care. Have a great day.